and then we're off to the races. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, our session tonight. Uh, we will have a panel um, called on trading zones between scholars and craftsmen, artisanal practices and mathematics in the early modern period. And our first uh, speaker tonight is um, Angela um, Axworthy. Um, one note before we uh, begin, we will do questions after each talk. So be prepared to raise your hand or drop a line in the in the chat if you have a question. Okay, Angela, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, just sharing. Um, okay, so uh, as I'm the first speaker, I'll say a few words on the aim of the seminar uh, session. So the aim of the three talks is to examine how in early modern Europe, the relation between artisanal material practices and mathematics could be understood. Uh, we want to consider in particular how real or imagined encounters between artisanal material knowledge and mathematical knowledge, theoretical and practical, were characterized. Our hope is to offer thereby new directions of research for the study of the relations between mathematics and artisanal practices, notably in connection with the notion of trading zones, such as defined by Pamela Long. Uh, while I will be presenting the ways in which Euclid's elements was dealt with in a more practical way in the 16th century, both within uh, practical geometry treatises and in the commentaries on the elements, Michael Friedman uh, will look at the way the German logician and mathematician Joachim Jungius attempted to offer a geometrical treatment of weaving practices and how his work interacted with other 17th century scientific investigations concerning textile. Thomas Morel, as for him, will show how the practical mathematics that was developed in the Saxon mines during the early modern era found a prominent place at the Dresden court, where it merged with a pre-existing academic scientific tradition. So practical geometry represented a strong tradition in the 16th century printed mathematical tradition. It was derived from medieval practical geometry, which started off as an independent type of geometrical teaching in the 12th century with Hugh of St. Victor's Practica Geometriae, but it took its origin in a multitude of traditions from the metrological corpus of Hero of Alexandria, Roman Agrimensura and Arabic treatises of applied geometry to the mathematical textbooks of clerical schools and Euclidean geometry. In Hugh of St. Victor's treatise, practical geometry was mainly presented as an art of measuring, notably by instrumental means, but it evolved in its content and approaches coming to include a larger group of topics from the making and use of terrestrial and astronomical measuring instruments to the con construction of complex curves. Throughout its evolution, the definition of the proper objects methods, finality, and epistemological status of practical geometry and its relation with theoretical geometry was thus in constant reassessment. The notion of geometria practica was related to the Greek notion of praxis, which overall means action. But this notion in geometry could be understood in various ways, standing for the concrete operations of land measurers as well as for the resolution and demonstration of abstract geometrical problems. In the 16th century, the printed practical geometry tradition came closer to the dominant parallel tradition of Euclid's elements, which was then presented as the canon of theoretical geometry. Indeed, a certain number of practical geometry treatises took up Euclidean material in a more recognizable manner and offered to teach Euclidean geometrical propositions in a practical way, for example, by translating the abstractly formulated constructions as a set of instrumental procedures, by considering magnitudes as measurable by co computational means, or by displaying some of their concrete uses 
for surveyors and architects. This approach to geometry contrasted with the approach associated with Euclid's elements, even in the altered versions transmitted by the medieval tradition, since geometrical objects were then mostly considered separately from numbers and from any reference to the material world. And the knowledge of magnitudes and of geometrical constructions was then axiomatically ordered, being demonstratively deduced from a set of abstract definitions and universal principles. Nevertheless, certain characteristics proper to the practical treatment of Euclid's propositions, such as found in the 16th century practical geometry treatises, could also be found within coeval adaptations, translations, and commentaries on the elements. As such, in their printed forms, both traditions in the 16th century mutually enriched each other in their content and approaches to geometry, making the boundary between practical and theoretical geometry harder even to define than before. So my aim here is to examine the practical treatment of Euclid's propositions in certain exemplary uh, 16th century commentaries on the elements and to compare it to the way Euclid's propositions were dealt with in contemporary practical geometry treatises. The examples I will consider stem from the practical geometry uh, treatises by Robert Record, Leonard and Thomas Diggs, Jacques Pelletier, and Juan Pérez de Moya, and from the commentaries on Euclid's elements by Niccolo Tartaglia, Johannes Schäuble, Wilhelm Holtzmann, or Xylander, Henry Billingsley, and Christoph Clavius. These texts were not only chosen here because they represent a culturally and stylistically diverse panel of cases in both traditions, but also because they all offer a properly practical treatment of Euclid's geometrical propositions. After showing a few practical features found uh, in both traditions, I'll briefly uh, look at how Euclid's propositions were dealt with in the practical geometry tradition, and then look in more details at the case of the commentaries on the elements. Among the type of features um, that were common to practical geometry treatises, and which were mostly absent from Euclid's text, even in the versions transmitted by the later Greek and medieval manuscripts and early prints, we can first count the geometrical diagrams that display process traces as compass arcs or dotted lines, which make explicit the instrumental processes required for the concrete execution of Euclid's constructions. The presence of such diagrams of the commentaries on the elements analyzed here, while common in practical geometry treatises, contrasts with the corresponding diagrams included in the more classical Latin editions of the elements and which follow more precisely Euclid's instructions. In connection with such diagrams, uh, textual references to instrumental procedures were also provided. In commentaries on the elements, these were mostly instruments used to perform the constructions required by Euclid's propositions, that is the compass and straight edge, or to verify their accuracy with the set square. These are different from most of the instruments presented in practical geometry treatises, that is surveying instruments, which are used to measure lengths and angles in concrete settings. The mention of instruments even if present in certain medieval versions of the elements, as in Campanus of Novara's 13th century commentary, which came into print in 1482, contrasts with the total absence of reference to instruments or of concrete applications in the Greek text of Euclid, as it was transmitted by the Latin translator, translations of Bartolomeo Zamberti in 1505 and of Federico Comandino in 1572. It, it is in any case a feature that is indissociable from practical geometry. As I will say again later, the number of such references notably increased in the later commentaries by Billingsley and Clavius. These references were also supplemented with illustrations of geometrical instruments, instructions to build some of the mentioned instruments, or specifications regarding their material features, as in the commentaries of Tartaglia, Billingsley and Clavius. Another practical feature shared by the two considered body of treatises, but which were typically excluded from Euclid's text, even in the medieval Latin tradition, are references to artisanal practices, broadly speaking, which is here represented by field measuring and commercial arithmetic, 
but also includes engineering, as in Dee's addition to Billingsley's commentary, the artisanal production of material artifacts in stone, wood, or iron, as in Tartaglia's commentary, cartography, as in the title of Records Pathway to Knowledge, as well as military architecture and the construction of mines, as in Dick's Pantometria. In connection with measuring practices, we also find in both sets of texts a numerical treatment of magnitudes. This is a feature typical of practical geometry treatises and intrinsically non-Euclidean, since Euclid never attributed any numerical values to magnitudes and even provided a separate treatment of the theory of ratios and proportions for magnitudes and for numbers. In the commentaries on Euclid presented here, notably in those of Schäubel and Xilanda, the numerical treatment of magnitudes does not only aim to, to connect discrete and continuous quantity when dealing with ratios and proportions, but also directly offered an arithmetical and algebraic treatment of the properties of the magnitudes dealt with by Euclid. Schäubel notably introduced his commentary on Euclid with a treatise of algebra that would enable the reader to better understand these arithmetical and algebraic interpretations of Euclid's propositions, which he then designated as numerorum praxis. Considering now the treatment of Euclid's propositions in both traditions, it is important to know that while commentaries on the elements dealt with all the principles and propositions contained in Euclid's treatise, at least in the books that were considered. Most practical geometry treatises that took up such Euclidean material only included a small selection of principles and propositions, most often only definitions. The propositions that were chosen were mostly drawn from book one to six to the exclusion of book five on the theory of proportions. And these were mainly problems as opposed to theorems, given their inherently practical character. As defined by, defined by Proclus in his commentary on Euclid, the aim of problems is to teach how to construct or find a certain geometrical object, while theorems aim to demonstrate a universal property or relation of geometrical objects. In this context, the Euclidean origin of these propositions was, was rarely acknowledged. The order of Euclid's propositions was only loosely observed and there was no wish to convey their logical dependence as it was on the contrary in editions of the elements. Pelletier actually claimed to follow an order more conform to the needs of practice than defined as the use of geometrical instruments. The focus of all these authors is indeed less on the demonstration of the epistemic perfection and consistency of geometry than on teaching efficient procedures to execute certain geometrical constructions, divisions, or measurements, for which they often presented alternative procedures, an approach proper to practical mathematics, and inherently absent from Euclid's elements. In practical geometry treatises, the text of Euclid, Euclidean propositions was therefore modified to satisfy this aim. Looking here at the example of proposition 111 to draw a straight line at right angles to a given straight line from a given point on it, which is present in all of the considered practical geometry treatises, we may know that none of these cases include Euclid's proof and all make explicit the steps of the instrumental procedure through which the construction may be concretely realized. Also, none refer to the principles or to other propositions on which this construction depends. However, in at least one case, that of Pelletier, the Euclidean conclusive clause, what was to be done, QEF, is used at the end of the proposition. Pérez de Moya, unlike the other authors considered here, explicitly referred to Euclid in the conclusion. The formulation of the enunciation is also made more straightforward. But contrary to Euclid's formulation, it makes more explicit the type of geometrical object that is constructed, that is, a perpendicular line or a plumb line, as Record called it. The construction itself is expanded and constitutes the bulk of the proposition. It is also relatively different from one text to the other and a fortiori from Euclid's original construction. One common feature, however, is the abandonment of the equilateral triangle 
which Euclid needs to prove that the construction is geometrically valid. Since the proof has been left aside, it is no longer needed. In record, the construction of the equilateral triangle certainly remains in the preliminary general exposition of the construction, though without a diagram, but it is removed when applied to the specific case. Also, in most of these cases, the intersection of compass arcs that are used to produce the line would not necessarily enable to construct an equilateral triangle, but in a, an isosceles triangle, which both simplifies and generalizes the actual execution of the construction. Looking now at the commentaries on Euclid, and first of all at Tartaglia's treatment of Proposition 1.1, which teaches how to draw an equilateral triangle on a given line, we may note that his Italian translation is overall quite faithful to the medieval Latin text of Campanus, which he chose to follow here, though he also knew the translation of Zamberti. As I noted earlier, Campanus' version itself presented practical characteristics that were absent from Euclid's Greek text, such as references to the compass in the two first propositions and the use of the first person singular to teach each steps of the construction, which conveys a pedagogical tone to Euclid's abstract discourse. Among changes added by Tartaglia to Campanus' uh, text is his translation of the infinitive collocare, to place or to construct, in the enunciation as possiamo costituir, we can construct, which emphasizes the pedagogical and practical tone already pre present in the original version. He also adds the clause e per eseguir tal cosa, and to accomplish this, to announce the various steps of the construction. The properly practical interpretation of this proposition actually comes forth in Tartaglia's commentary, where he presents the method to construct an equilateral triangle when it is not required to prove the validity of the construction, that is to demonstrate that it properly allows to produce an equilateral triangle and that it has been carried out by operations authorized in the framework of Euclid's geometry. As Tartaglia asserted here, the fact of tracing out full circles in Euclid's Proposition 1.1 is only needed when it is necessary to demonstrate that the two constructed line segments BC and AC are equal to each other and to the given line AB. Hence, when the geometer only needs to effectively construct an equilateral triangle, it suffices to draw two intersecting arcs of circles according to the interval of the given line which is easily done with a compass that maintains an opening equal to the length of the given line. This approach is practical in so far as it enables to know how to effectively obtain the requested figure without demonstrating why this construction is appropriate to this aim. Scheibel's case is best illustrated by his treatment of Proposition 1.3 given two unequal straight lines to cut off from the greater a straight line equal to the less. He then replaces Euclid's proposition by three different versions of the construction or three operaciones or fabricae. The first corresponds to the most practical construction. Instead of requesting that a line equal to the shorter given line be placed at one extremity of the longer, and then to draw a circle according to its length that will cut off from the longer line, a segment equal to it, as in Euclid's construction, he invites the reader to directly take the length of the shorter line with a compass, and then to mark a point in the longer line according to this interval with the mobile leg of the compass. Euclid's demonstration is then reduced to a brief mention of common notion one, through which he merely hints at the way the proof should be conducted. For the second construction, Schäuble proposes instructions that are closer to those of Euclid, insofar as a circle is drawn after the extremities of the two lines, after the extremities of the two lines have been conjoined. However, it is not a line equal to the shorter line that is placed at one extremity of the longer line, but the actual given lines that are assumed as conjoined, 
which implies that they have been transferred toward each other through a mechanical rather than through a geometrical me method. That is not according to a mode of operation authorized by any of Euclid's constructive postulates or by a previously demonstrated construction. Moreover, Schäuble here specifies that only an arc of circle may be drawn, which is the construction illustrated by the diagram, and which, as noted by Tartaglia, is only allowed when the demonstration is disregarded in favor of the practical execution of the construction. The proof is then reduced to a mere reference to Euclid's definition of the circle. Scheibel's third construction is more faithful to Euclid's construction insofar as it appeals to proposition 1-2 to place at one extremity of the longer line one that is equal to the given shorter line. However, he then simply refers to the construction taught in the second operation to cut from the longer line a segment equal to the shorter line. Moreover, he does not provide here any demonstration. What evokes here the treatment of Euclid's propositions found in practical geometry treatises is not only the direct appeal to instrumental procedures and the reduction or suppression of the proof, but also the freedom taken with the structure of the proposition, which is also shown by the fact that Schäuble systematically suppressed the lettering of the diagram and thus the exposition, specification and particular conclusion, which have no purpose without the lettered diagram. The fact of providing different modes of construction is also practical in the sense that it does not follow one determinate argumentative model and offers the possibility to choose the construction that is most appropriate to one situation, placing the circumstances in which the construction is to be performed above its geometrical validity and its function in Euclid's axiomatic system. Also, contrary to Tartaglia, Schäuble provides no justification for his practical translation of Euclid's proposition. Xylander's practical approach is most clearly exemplified by Proposition 1.1. He then clearly distinguished the construction from the proof in Euclid's proposition, attributing to each of them a separate title and provided supplementary practical information in the commentary. His German translation of Euclid from the Greek is more faithful to Euclid's text than the Latin text of Schäuble, but he nevertheless formulates Euclid's discourse in a more straightforward and hands-on manner, using more common terms and referring to the use of the compass. As indicated by the title of the constructive part and by its introduction, Silanda invites the reader to understand the content of the proposition by means of the provided diagram, the Beigesetz de Figur, which he directly teaches how to perform instrumentally. The use of the first person in active indicative, begreif ich, to explain the first steps of the construction, and of the second person in the conclusion, so hast du, places the reader in the hypothetical situation of being directly taught by the author, as if he were physically shown how to perform the different actions required to draw out a particular figure on a sheet of paper or sandboard. In doing so, Xilander does not only incite the reader to reproduce the figure concretely, or at least in a hypothetical concrete setting, but also to deduce the truthfulness of the construction by empirical means, by observing the diagram and by observing the setting of the compass during the construction process. In the commentary, which he entitled Varnung, which we can translate here as advice or tip, Xilander addresses the unlearned reader, the Einfältige. The guidance offered here is approximately the same as that which was provided by Tartaglia, in the sense that it teaches how to perform the construction when no demonstration is needed. Billingsley's English translation of the elements as shown in his exposition of Proposition 1.9 is much more faithful than the respective approaches of Schäuble and Xylander to Proposition 1.3 and 1.1. The only notable modification uh, he makes here to the proposition is his use of the second person active imperative in the construction, take, cut, draw, describe, instead of the passive perfect imperative in the third person used by Euclid, let be taken, let be cut off, as translated, for instance, by Zamberti, as connectato, constituato. 
This again emphasizes the practical character of the construction steps by directly instructing the reader to perform them. His practical treatment of Euclid's propositions, that is of most of the problems of book one, is confined to a separate and clearly delimited part of the commentary. This part follows here several sections presenting related problems, alternative demonstration in case, cases, all of which are approached in the same way as Euclid's proposition. In the last section, Billingsley thus teaches how to divide a rectiline angle into equal parts mechanically. As Billingsley writes at the very beginning, mechanically in this context is equivalent to readily, which means promptly or easily, but also without considering the demonstration, thereby presenting a non-demonstrative but efficient technique to perform the requested constructions, as did Tartaglia and Xilanda. As the latter, Billingsley makes explicit the use of the compass to perform the construction. The deictic words and sentences used here by Billingsley, and here note, as in the figure here in the end of the other side put, are also marks of a practical discourse, since he then contextualizes his teaching and addresses the reader directly. Clavius's treatment of Euclidean problems, also exemplified by Proposition 1.9, is quite similar to that of Billingsley, insofar as he remains quite faithful to Euclid's text in the proposition and dealt with the practical treatment of the proposition in an entirely separate part. He entitled this part Paxis to mark its practical status and scope. Also, as in Billingsley's mechanical interpretation of the proposition, the Paxis aims to teach a quicker way to perform the requested construction. Again, what allows to perform the construction in a quicker manner is the use of the compass and the fact of leaving aside the constructive step steps required for the demonstration, that is the construction of the line DE and of the equilateral triangle DEF. During the enumeration of these different steps, Clavius also offers practical tips in parentheses, explaining directly to the reader that he can choose to adopt a different opening of the compass during the second step of the construction if he wants, see Wellis meaning that the construction of an isosceles triangle is then as effective as that of an equilateral triangle. Now, if Clavius's intention in his praxis is to teach how to perform the construction in a quicker manner, he does not totally dismiss the demonstration, since he briefly refers to it when he mentions the equality of the angles DAF and EAF. He thus shows that even if the lines necessary to Euclid's proof are not made visible in the practical construction, its various steps are nevertheless founded on the same principles as the original construction. After presenting the practical execution of Proposition 1.9, Clavius also expresses reservations concerning the intelligibility of Euclid's construction in comparison with that accomplished by the means of pure praxis, practice, sorry, nuda praxis insofar as it would generate confusion rather than clarity due to the great number of lines that make up Euclid's diagram. Therefore, the praxis for Clavius would not only serve as a means to perform the construction more promptly, but would also make the proposition easier to understand. Clavius follows these remarks with an alternate, alternative case when there is not enough space to perform the construction on and between the legs of the angle using the same practical approach. In the scolium that follows the praxis, Clavius deals with divisions of rectilinear angles in more than two equal parts. After mentioning the complex and mechanically generated curves by which ancient mathematicians proceeded to solve the famous problem of the trisection of the angle, he teaches the manner in which common or unlearned men divide a given rectilinear angle in any number of equal angles, which is mainly done by trial and error. He thus advises us to use a compass whose opening is increased or decreased until the needed interval is obtained so that the angle be approximately divided in the desired number of equal parts. For this construction, he uses the lettering of Euclid's original diagram and proposes to demonstrate it. 
So as I showed here, the practical treatment of Euclid's propositions in the considered commentaries on the elements presented characteristics that are similar to those provided in practical geometry treatises, such as the fact of making explicit the instrumental procedures, leaving aside the proof, and therefore disregarding the steps of the construction required for the demonstration. The text was then also sometimes made more straightforward and proposed alternative, simpler means of construction, dismissing references to principles or prior propositions. Yet, unlike the way it occurred in practical geometry treatises, the fact of adopting a practical approach to Euclid's propositions could not be taken for granted in the commentaries and generally incited authors to provide an explanation or justification. The practical treatment of the proposition was then also often placed in well delimited parts of the commentary so as to be clearly distinguished from Euclid's text. A clear exception to this is Schäuble, who replaced Euclid's text by three alternative versions of his proposition, of his construction actually, starting with the most practical one. D'Artagnan and Xilanda also introduced certain practical elements within the text of the proposition, in the sense that they directly refer to the instrumental procedure. D'Artagnan was certainly taking up Campanus, but he knew Zamberti's translation from the Greek and acknowledged it as more accurate. Sorry. From Tartaglia to Clavius, a greater respect for Euclid's text was thus observed as commentators benefited from more accurate translations and from Proclus's commentary on Euclid's first book. And the distinction with its practical interpretation is made clearer. Yet Billingsley and Clavius also appealed to a practical interpretation of Euclid's problems more systematically than their predecessors, that is, in the majority of problems of Book I, instead of only in the first proposition of Book I, as in Tartaglia and Xilanda. They also acknowledged and promoted the practical character of this approach more explicitly, being designated as mechanical or as praxis. In Clavius, the practical approach to geometrical propositions is not only sanctioned, but actually placed above Euclid's theoretical approach in terms of intelligibility for the student of geometry with regard to both the construction and the demonstration. Since to him, the theoretical discourse may be found and actually be better understood within and through its practical treatment. On the other hand, this approach was also connected with constructions by trial and error by their common appeal to the compass. Now, as I also showed at the beginning, this approach to Euclid's propositions in the commentaries resonates with other features typical of practical geometry treatises and which connect Euclid's teaching to a utilitarian and empirical approach to geometry by offering a numerical treatment of magnitudes, a hands-on interpretation of Euclid's propositions and uh, by setting forth artisanal uses of geometry. In both practical and Euclidean printed geometrical, geometrical traditions, even for those written in vernacular languages, the fact that this teaching was primarily addressed to craftsmen and that it was intended to be applied to resolve concrete problems is highly doubtful due to the scholarly context of production of these texts, as well as their, because of their uh, high level of generality. Hence, in this context, most of these practical editions aimed, for instance, to help the reader get a better sense of the content of Euclid's discourse by appealing to the senses. They also provide tools to reproduce or verify the conclusions of Euclid through empirical or numerical means and to demonstrate the wide scope of ge ge geometry's usefulness. Yet this practical and allegedly utilitarian treatment of Euclid's elements um, notably when combined with the use of the vernacular, points to a certain will on the part of 16th century mathematicians from both practical and Euclidean tradition to connect even hypothetically the content of this ancient and canonical textbook of arithmetic and geometry to the more concrete world and preoccupations of craftsmen and to potentially draw attention to a more um, diverse audience. This does not only manifest the changes in the status of empirical and artisanal knowledge in early modern mathematical texts, but also points to the later adoption of more mechanistic approaches to theoretical geometry in the 17th century.
thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the talk, um, Angela, that's great. Um, okay, so if you have questions, please raise your hand or uh, drop a line in the chat. Uh, we have at least 10 minutes for questions, I think. Uh, okay, there is um, already a question from Robert. Robert, do you want to uh, just uh, read it out loud? So um, it also appears on YouTube. Okay, uh, the question is, are any of these texts used in the university curricula? Well, uh, yes. Um, Clavius, for, for example, uh, was a Jesuit professor in the, at the Collegio Romano and his edition of Euclid was, well, not entirely, but was destined to his students. Uh, it is indeed more complex in its contents uh, than what students would need, but students would there find uh, what, they, what they needed, and that was his intention in any case. Um, as for, um, well, Schäubel and Xilanda, um, and Xilanda they were both um, professors, uh, I think, at the University of Tübingen. So um, actually, um, Xilanda taught Greek as well, and he was uh, for one year or, or two, um, I think, but just after he, he wrote his uh, translation, a professor um, of mathematics, not only of Greek. Uh, as for Scheibel, he was clearly um, professor of mathematics and he has a whole discussion in the preface of his edition of Euclid on his methods to, to facilitate uh, access to Euclid. For example, taking away the letters that are more confusing than anything else. Um, as for Billingsley, it's, it's unclear that he actually taught uh, John Dee who prefaced um, his, his edition has taught, uh, but uh, that's very. Um, that's that wasn't his main, uh, main main the main element of his career. Uh, and as for those authors of practical geometries I mentioned, uh, some did teach, such as uh, Jacques Pelletier. Uh, I think Perez de Moya taught also, uh, but he taught I think in um, classes for um, navigators, and so that would. Be something to to look into a bit more but um i must say i need to check that out again and uh who else well robert record and Diggs. um i must say um i would need to check again as well sorry uh, for, for this lack and as for the euclidean tradition did i forget somebody um tartalia yes he taught as well but he's quite a hybrid uh feature uh character he, he taught private classes um, to uh, members of the nobility uh, in, in Italy, but he was yeah, from a modest background and, um, but however, managed to uh, translate texts and teach them to yeah, members of the nobility. Thank okay. you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mihail? Yeah. Hi, Angela. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a short question. So um, you mentioned for one of the authors that they use um, the, um, um, the first person uh, voice, right? Um, so how often or how common was it uh, in other textbooks? Uh, because obviously it was common for other, uh, other disciplines, this direct evidence um, experiments. You mean in other other textbooks than uh, practical geometries or um, or also in practical yeah that and also on other commentaries on Euclid actually um, um, I, um, I I say I haven't counted um, it's um, it depends I mean uh, for example people such as Comandino and uh, Zamberti of course they will not use the first person because they they took after the Greek text uh, so Campanas uh, the the version that he had was translated from the Arabic but I don't know whether the Arabic uh, did use the first person um, it is it is relatively common because they all rewrite the proofs and so as they rewrite the proofs they use some um, some some verbs not only first person but second person you will this and that it's 
I'm not going to say it's the majority of the cases. For example, in Orange Fine, you don't have this. Um, but it's it's not that rare. But it's important to note because it's um, there is there is a didactic um, a component to this, which is quite different from the kind of abstract uh, language that you have in the in Euclid's text from at least from Zamberti's translation. Um, David. Hi, Angela. Thanks. Thanks Hi. for the talk. This is just a follow up to the first question, actually, because I have the impression that many of these texts seems to be or could have been used as for autodidactic purposes. That is, there is a there are a lot of explanation that seems to fit if you want to learn by yourself and you don't need a teacher. That, so I wonder if we can you can say anything about this. There are there is evidence for or against this hypothesis well um first of all I, I i totally agree with you i i think the fact of ac having access to printing uh allowed the authors you know in com on contrast with manuscripts uh which were circulating in more closed um and perhaps more specialized um environments having access to print means you don't really know who's going to read you uh even though you can have an a a privileged um, uh, audience in mind. So um, you will you will indeed have in mind, especially at, the, at that time, uh, people who are literate enough to, uh, to read these, but who also uh, can come from different backgrounds. So of course, I'm, I'm not, I'm coming back to your question of, um, but that means that some will not be in the university. It doesn't mean that they're not learned. They could be members of the court, uh, humanists, for example, for vernacular text, it doesn't mean that it's going to be um, read necessarily uh, to craftsmen, as I said. It can be simply um, read by humanists who were, wanted a bit more, a uh, bit of light reading. So indeed, um, in pre practical geometry, it's even more obvious that um, some of these texts condensed um, geometrical um, principles, notably Euclidean geometrical principles, condensed them with more practical and recreational content, um, which could enable people to did, who didn't have access to, for example, university training and so forth, to, to access this, this uh, geometrical or mathematical uh, knowledge. So there's the recreative aspect that um, will um, draw uh, um, the reader to, to dive into this content, which obviously is more, it's not something that you would develop um, in a university uh, or in a classroom context. That would be more of a private matter. Um, Yes, so, and, and, and for example, Orange Finet and, and many other um, French, mainly French, I would say, um, mathematician or commentators of Euclid, they write that they had to learn mathematics by themselves because the university wasn't able to give them um, the training, the teaching that was um, required um, actually to, to start learning philosophy because they come back to the ancient model of, of, of mathematics as being the, the key to philosophy. So they, they complain a lot about this and say, well, I have to write a textbook for all these people who actually need uh, to, to, to access this knowledge. Thank you. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take Monica's question and then Dan can wait till the end so that we don't eat up into um, other people's time. So if we have uh, time at the end, Dan can ask uh, Mon Monica. All right, so I had two questions. I'll try to make them short. Um, so I wrote down some things and I have a couple of follow back questions. One is because I don't know who Campanus is. Uh, there was a slide where you had the diagrams from his work that had no traces. And then on the bottom, there were like guys who had the traces of, right? So why was the, you know, who I, I just missed that part, right? So why is it that in his case, you don't have the traces and then you have the diagram, like the compass traces in the other people. So that's an easy one. And then there's something um, where you said like, they only picked up some things from Euclid in the practical treatises. 
um, so in the case that they did pick up things, did you notice something different from, I don't know, maybe like descriptions or what the sort of things they would say about the definitions in the beginning, for instance, were they just all reproduced the same, right? So there was like, no, as if it like, oh, these things are clear, they're not bound to have any practical, you know, interpretations or like this debate, we have no debate, you know, this is what they are. Uh, we're just going to go with the problems, right? So do you see even in those things that were picked up, any slight variation or changes or anything like that? Did something strike as interesting? So um, thank you for your questions. Uh, so first of all, yeah, Campanus, I, I mentioned him after I pre presented this, this slide and then I thought, I thought that was a mistake. Anyway, uh, so he was um, 13th century commentator of Euclid and probably the most important um, transmitter of the Euclidean tradition um, before the 16th century. So he, his uh, commentary was the first ever printed version of Euclid in 1482 in Venice. And so it had immense influence for at least, um, I, I'd say even the 1550s. So for example, his, his version of Euclid was collated with the translation from the Greek by Bartolomeo Zamberti uh, in a co so collated edition side by side by Jacques Lefebvre d'Etaples in 1516, because obviously the versions were different. Campanus's version, he didn't translate it himself, but it's uh, from, from the Ar Arabic. So you have terms that, that, that remain with the Arabic uh, consonant. And um, you have the, the, the Greek version by, by Zamberti. But mathematically, it's, it's more interesting than the one by Zamberti. So it's, it's very interesting in the history of, of the Euclidean transmission. And Tartaglia, he knew both. And he actually says, oh, uh, Zamberti is more uh, accurate philologically, but people know Campanus better. So I will not translate. He translated in Italian. He didn't say, I'm not going to translate the point by Signo, like uh, Zamberti. A signum, but as punto, uh, punctum from Campanus. So Campanus, that's that's him, and his um, diagrams are conform more conform to the instructions of Euclid. That is to draw full circles, not compass arcs, not arcs. That is something that's practical because you need the circles in these 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 constructions to prove that the the lines. Uh, that are compared are equal. If you don't have these circles anymore, uh, then you cannot. And also the circle, it, to draw a circle is, is one of the operations that was authorized by Euclid in the, the first three postulates. So these are the, 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 the principles that authorize certain um, operations, which is to draw a line from one point to the other, a straight line, sorry, to prolong it, that's the second, and to draw a circle. So you don't have anywhere in Euclid something that says, oh, just draw an arc uh, and, and move the compass, you know, <laughs> from one, one branch to the other, and these will all be equal. Now you have to draw the full circle. That's why they're different. And that's why it's very important to this difference between these. Um, and as for your second question, um, sorry, my, my memory has gone just quickly. Can we well, can say actually, in, Monica, can you do that at the end? Because we're I'll do it. I'm, yes. I'm really afraid we'll run. And out I'm time curious if any, if all the you know if some of the other participants oh, yeah, yeah. have something to say to the questions, I'm fine. Justifications. Yeah, yeah the, the, there wasn't much justifications, just to say they gave the the, the the sometimes the definitions were the only things. There were a few definitions, they were just presented as uh, the, the, the principles, the theoretical part of geometry. And then they went into the, the, the constructions and so forth and the, the, the instruments. Not, not much justifications. And they were very different from one practical geometry to the other, what they took from Euclid. But yeah, I can't say more right now. I'll, I'll come back to it afterwards if I have time. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. All right, so let's move on to the second talk of the uh, evening from uh, Michael Friedman. Um, you have the floor. Thanks, so I'll share the screen. Okay, great, everyone can see it, right? Yeah. So let's start. Um, so hello everyone, um, good evening. 
Um, well, case in Israel. Um, so, as Angel already noted, uh, what we aim to examine today, or perhaps re-examine, is the notion of trading zones between artisans and mathematicians during the early modern age. I'm going to discuss uh, textiles as such a trading zone, and in that way to pose the question, what was actually the nature of these trading zones, and in which ways did they exist? If there was indeed a direct contact of artisans, that is in my case weavers, with mathematicians and natural philosophers, did it result in reorganization of knowledge systems, prompting the emergence of new mathematical knowledge? Did the artisans themselves profit from these contacts or was such a transfer only on the level of, for example, metaphorical usage, one which did not act as a catalysator for new conceptions or concepts? So in my talk, I'm going to concentrate on Joachim Jungius, a German logician and mathematician who was mostly well known for his studies in chemistry, logic and botany. But before turning to Jungius reflections on textiles, I am. Uh, I want to emphasize that textiles were not some marginal item for natural philosophers. So Simon Weret, in his recent book uh, *Thrift in Science*, notes the interest scholars in the early modern period took in clothes, fabrics, and rags. Where it notes that the shifts in the history of science uh, of early modern age, from the history of innovation to history of circulation of knowledge points not only to a broader definition of experiment, but also calls to paying closer attention to the importance of materials within domestic setting, settings. So pieces of stockings, rags, socks, and all sorts of fabrics certainly belong to these household related objects. Where it notes that such objects, objects were in early modern period open-ended and capable of serving a variety of purposes. And much experimental activity involved making use of existing things, especially at home. Where it gives the example of Robert Zimmer, who argued in the 18th century for a theory of electricity based on experiments with his socks. So we will see that Jungius himself exemplified his theory of materials with stockings. This theory, though being of another character, is another indication that and as where it says, natural philosophers used clothes and fabrics for experiment, and in fact, the practices surrounding clothing in modern in early modern homes helped to illustrate the diverse ways in which material objects might be put to good use. Now, while this approach focuses on the domestic settings. Uh, where products of their artisanal work are already to be found and not necessarily on the encounter between artisans and scholars, Pamela Long puts the accent exactly on this encounter, asking whether, and I cite, artisans, practitioners influence the development of the new science, adding that by the expression artisaners, art, artisan practitioners, she means, and I said again, broadly diverse group of skilled artisans, such as weavers and instrument makers, and station, among others. Nevertheless, any thorough discussion on the community of weavers is actually missing from her work. Pamela Smith, in her work on artisanal epistemology, stresses the passage of knowledge from one found in artisanal expertise into another type of knowledge, the one encapsulated with the formation of the new scientific method. While I do not wish now to enter a debate on Smith, Long, and eventually Gallison's conception of trading zones in artisanal epistemology, I am going to question this passage of knowledge by looking, as noted, on textiles and how it was considered by mathematicians or how textiles were considered or conceived as caring mathematical knowledge. So I'm going to begin with an example uh, that Angela actually talked about, but I'm going to examine it much more critically. That is on Robert Records, let's call it non-example from the 16th century. So obviously the focus of my talk is the 17th century, but I want to begin with this um, citation eventually from Robert's record. So I'm going to examine a certain passage from Records 5051 book, Pathway to Knowledge, which actually links uh, weaving with geometry. So Record 
says carpenters, um, carvers, joiners, and masons, painters and laminers with such occupations. Broders, goldsmiths, if they be cunning, must yield to geometry thanks to their learning. And I jump to the last two lines. So weavers by geometry had their foundation. Their loom is a frame of strange imagination. Well, record uh, was a Welsh doctor and mathematician who invented the equals symbol. In his book, well, as Angela said, could be considered as a bright version of the first four books of elements, uh, of Euclid's elements. So there are no proofs in this book, but rather examples and explanations. But if we now concentrate on the citation above, then I want, first of all, to uh, present the um, analysis that Eleanor Chan uh, presented. Uh, she said, actually, in her recent book, that the loom was an analog of the accumulation of lines in a literal sense, the warp and the weft of the weaving or tapestry, hence underlying the ambiguous way according to which geometry was understood. Now, this geometry, I said again, is not synonymous with the patterns created by the warp and the weft structure of weaving, but the foundation of the created fabrics of threads considered as lines and even of points is to be found in geometry. Now, here actually Chen herself nuances her own position. So she says, while these geometrical objects are imagined or translated into material form, such that, such that these abstract principles can be put to practical use, the basis in geometry, however, was undercut by a powerful sense of the mutability of these surfaces. That is, the fact that fabrics and threads are worn out, recycled, reused, and eventually thrown out. Now, Chan claims that there is here a geometrical system that shimmers between the material and the immaterial. Now, while Chan arguments are important to understand the visual language of early modern European geometry and how it borrowed contemporary, contemporary visual culture, few questions actually arise. Was this material geometry helpful? for the weavers themselves? Or was it the projection of records IDs on their artisanal work? As Chan argues, I quote, a cursory glance at his items reveals an insight into the way these classical elements were imagined for carpenters, carvers, joiners, masons, brothers, and weavers, in citation. But here, in fact, lies the crux of the ambiguousness. Was the notion of a geometrical point or a line imagined for the weavers or by the weavers? Did weavers even need the notion of a geometrical point to discuss uh, about the intersection of two threads? To underline, the question is not whether a geometric line is an abstraction of thread, but rather whether the artisans, in this case the weavers, had also benefited from developing geometric, geometric conceptions in the 16th and 17th century, and whether the mathematicians and natural philosophers regained novel insights from the developing weaving industry. Or to phrase it more concretely, did Record's conception of space and geometrical objects overlapped with the artisans. So with these questions, I want to move actually to Jung's reflections on weaving from the 17th century. So in this century, I claimed the encounter between weaving and mathematics actually becomes more ex explicit. An example for that can be found in Descartes. So Descartes in his um, 10th rule of his Regular says that um, the following, in order to acquire discernment, we should exercise our native intelligence by investigating what others have already discovered and methodologically server, server even the most insignificant products of human skill, especially those which display or presuppose order. Descartes advises that one must first tackle the simplest and least exalted arts, and especially those in which order prevails, such as weaving and carpet making or the more feminine arts of embroidery in which threads are interwoven in an infinitely varied pattern. Now, Descartes' emphasis on displaying or presupposing order may be interpreted in two ways, as referring either to the resulting pattern of the finished weave or to the order of actions while using the loom. But any such explicit explanation is absent from Descartes' writing. 
Nevertheless, if we concentrate now on Jung use, then the questions posed above, well, before concerning a record can be answered more positively and more concretely. That is the encounter between mathematics and textiles and textile practices becomes more explicit in, in Jung's writings. So to recall uh, who was actually Joachim Jungius, he was a German logician, mathematician, and natural philosopher, and he was well known at the beginning, well, first half of the 17th century. Uh, he published uh, several books, Geometria Empirica, Logica Hamburgenesis, Disputationum in 1642, and posthumously Toxocopea Physicae Minores in 1662. Now, his work was well known to numerous scholars, uh, for example, to uh, Samuel Hartlieb, uh, Comenius, John Pell, and later Leibniz, all of whom praised Jungius and his work. So, for example, uh, William Risse in his book, uh, Die Logik der Neuzeit, uh, says that Leibniz commended Jungius as one of the best logicians. He declared that the Logica Hamburgenesis to be the most important logic book of the 17th century. However, it would be an understatement to say that Jungius was not in a hurry to publish his writings and notes. His Nachlass contained thousands of pages, of which only several books were edited and published after his death during the 17th century. And after parts of the Nachlass were unfortunately burned in 1691 at the house of Vagetius, who was at the time responsible for Jungius' writings, what was left of Jungius' notes was not further edited. Nevertheless, num numerous manuscripts did survive. So one of Jungius' hardly researched manuscripts is a set of notes called Texturae Contemplatio, written between the early 1620s and the late 1640s, containing reflections on textile practices. In this manuscript, Jungius suggests, among other topics he discusses, a geometrization of textile practices, beginning the manuscript with numerous definitions and theorems, afterwards describing different weaving techniques and methods. These notes point toward a possible mathematical theory of weaving patterns and practices, a theory which hardly existed in the 17th century, and it raises therefore also the question concerning a possible encounter, whether imaginary or real, between mathem mathemati mathematics or mathematicians and the artisanal practice of weaving. Now, before examining this manuscript in more details, I want to explicate first which kind of manuscript we actually have in our hands. So Textual Contemplatio was probably put together in Hamburg between 6060 and 6078, when former Jungian students arranged and transcribed uh, his notes. Martin Vogel, one of his students who was in charge of the Nachlass, took some of these copies with him to Hanover, where Leibniz managed to purchase his library in 1678. Jungus' original collection of notes was probably lost in the fire that was mentioned in, six, in 1691. Well, um, but, and that means that Textura Contemplatio was actually not published in any form, even though Leibniz expressed his wish for this to happen, and Leibniz himself actually copied and further edited Textura Contemplatio. So what was the content of Jungius' mathematical reflections with respect to weaving? He begins his, this manuscript with a list of definitions and theorems on woven structures on, or weaves. So, the most complete version of the set of definitions and theorems is to be found on folio 62R of Textura Contemplatio, and it is titled as follows, a contemplation of weaving concerning knowledge of position. So ad scientiam situs. And this is followed by a series of definitions. And the definitions are as follows. He first defines what is warp and weft. Um, and then he says a simple weave, the textura simpler, is defined as when a thread crosses under as many threads as it goes over. A double weave, textura dupla, is defined as when double the number of threads go under on any side as the number of threads that it sends over, etc. Now, apart from the warp and the weft 
what does Jung use define here? So he notes, first of all, that the most basic form of weaving, what is called textura simpla, is obtained by a regular alternation of lifting the warp threads. Today, this is called plain tabby or tafeta weave. And this is actually uh, presented in the slide. This weave is obtained when the weft thread crosses the warp threads by going over one warp thread, then under the next, and so on. However, to this definition, one should add the rule that in the next row, the alternation shifts by one thread. So that is, if in one row, the weft thread processes as follows, that is plus, minus, plus, minus, et cetera, where plus means going above and minus going below the warp thread, then for the next row, the thread will pass as follows, the minus, plus, minus, plus, et cetera. Now, it is essential to emphasize that plus minus notation was not used in neither by Jungius nor by his contemporaries during the 17th century or after, but is rather used here only to illustrate how weaves are structured. However, um, so this is another essential point to emphasize, Jungius did use the terms above and below, and now in German, to describe how the weft thread passes. So the plus minus notation is not so much an invention disconnected from Jungius way of thinking. However, this relation between the rows is a relation that Jungius does not describe explicitly. But if one looks at Jungius drawings at, of various weaves, it can be concluded that he was certainly aware of it. The same partial definition then appears for textura dupla, tripla, and then textura quadrupla. Now, the above series of definitions ends with a more elaborate explanation of the weave called textura quadrupla. And the definition is as follows. Textura quadrupla is defined when in one fabric, whether on the side or on the surface, the threads of one row weft go over a fifth thread with four threads of another row, row, row warp having been sent under. Here, one may actually notice that even if Jungius claims that in one row, the pattern of the passing of the weft thread is plus, uh, sorry, minus plus, 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 there is no way to indicate, to induce whether in the next row, there will be a shift in this pattern by one thread or by several threads. For example, with the weave that is called today for one twill, its weft rows look as follows. That is, there is only a shift with one thread at the next row as can be seen with this plus minus notation. However, there are also other weaves which can be considered under the definition of textura quadrupla. And this is exactly what is dealt by Jungius theorems, which are in fact a collection of four statements about this textura quadrupla. These theorems are to be found in a folio titled, uh, again, page two, a contemplation of weaving concerning knowledge of situation. And here, actually, Jungius does explicate the relations between the roles of the weft, which may explain why he called these statements theorems and not definitions. For example, why theorem one deals with what Jungius calls continuous textura quadrupla, theorem two deals with the properties of intermittent textura quadrupla. That is, well, the first weave is a 4 one twill as is presented here. The second is what is called a 4-1 um, satin weave, which is presented in the slide. And on the right, one can see how Jungius actually draws these, let's call it diagrams or drawings of these various weaves. Now, the attempt to introduce some mathematical deductive structure of various weaves can be considered as one of the main parts of the manuscript, though one can argue this, there is no real deduction here eventually. There are only definitions and eventually theorems, but there are no demonstrations and it's entirely unclear what is actually, why there are, these are called theorems. Now, it is, however, a ma the main part of the text because this is attested by the number of times the definitions and the theorems were copied and recopied. Also essential to note is Jungius' approach, uh, which may be termed a prototopological conception of, of a geometrical structure that is underlying the position of the threads as the title of this part hints. It becomes clear that the relations between the various weft rows do not depend on metrical properties. 
But were these theorems also relevant to the artisans? Indeed, the definitions and the theorems were for the artisans actually obvious, since they were descriptive. And this points to a tension which exists between the two groups, at least in the way they're reflected in Jung's manuscript. Now, the question is, does or do these reflections actually appear in a wider context? And the answer is positive. So before examining actually more critically um, Jung's own attempts uh, to present uh, dramatical theorems based on weaving, I want to understand the context or the background of such reflections. And now Jung's reflections on textiles aimed also to explain the processes of composition and decomposition of materials. He introduces in his writings two types of parts of a body. These are the hypostatic parts, parts which can exist outside a body after its decomposition, and sinipostatic parts, parts which by themselves have neither existence nor persistence. How was this distinction essential for Jungus to think about textiles? One of the examples given by Jung used to illustrate these two types of parts is a piece of fabric. This example is explicitly presented in his 6042 book, Disputationum de Principis Corporum Naturalium. According to Jung used, the decomposition of a woven fabric gives rise to threads that can exist independently of fabric. Furthermore, the threads themselves can be decomposed into fabrics. So he says the following, thus, the thread is a hypostatic part of the fabric. It can be separated from the lining in such a way that it is no longer part of a fabric. In the same way, the fiber is a part of the thread, which is twisted from several fibers. However, if one considered the contact arrangement and position of the threads of the fabric, then while these are also parts of the fabric, since they give it its specificity, specificity and structure, one can only speak in this case of sinipostatic parts. For if the woven fabric is dissolved and ceases to be a fabric, then the order, position, and mutual contact of the threads no longer exist. However, a woven fabric consists of parts which are hypostatic as well as of parts which are sinipostatic, whereby the latter are destroyed during the fabric's decomposition. Now, that Jungius was exemplifying these parts concretely with fabrics is to be seen in an undated drawing of Jungius of interwoven threads, where he discusses also knitted clothes and stockings, among other fabrics. There, Jungius brings an example of different types of textiles different methods of preparation result in different properties. Jungius Textua Contemplatio contains also other reflections on textiles, from their production processes to few arithmetical calculations. However, was Jungius an exception with his reflections on weaving and mathematics? We already saw with record and somewhat with Descartes that the answer is negative. To give one more example, I want to turn to uh, Samuel Hartlieb's mathematical weaving. So Hartlieb was a German polymath who settled in England and who developed a wide network of correspondence known as the Hartlieb Circle, which was set up from about 1630. In a series of letters between, uh, written in between 1653 and 1657 to several scholars, Hartlieb discusses innovations in weaving. The title of this series is Innov Innovations Textoria Volzogens, and there he refers to Johann Ludwig von, von Volzogen, an Austrian philosopher and mathematician. In 1651, Hartley writes the follows. A curious and accommodatious weaving instrument mentioned by Mr. John Pell, which the Swedish Baron Volzogen's wife did use in Holland to get her subsistence by, is much used in Bohemia, whereby waist, waistcoats in all manner of colors are exactly woven. Weaving Volzogen's in Sweden, Volzogen being mathematical, can easily send a description with a delineation of it. Hartlieb refers to a loom found in Holland 
hence probably to a ribbon loom, since these were widespread in Holland at the beginning of the 17th century. Two years later, he notes the following. Monsieur Volzogen's lady made use of such a loom in Amsterdam, and he continues, ladies and women of quality in Moravia, etc., had small looms about the bigness of a common desk in which they used to weave silk waistcoats and other such small textures, and that this art they called Le Petit Mystère. Now, according to Hartlib conception, if Volzogen, being mathematical, can easily describe this loom, then it may have an affinity with mathematics or with mathematical principles, although Hartlieb does not explain what is the nature of this. The lack of this explanation may explain why he actually calls it le petit mystère. So I want to slowly come to a conclusion. The question that arises is whether the examination of texture or textile machines indeed operated as a small mystery, as an epistemic object, but one whose function may only be limited to the understanding of looms, or whether it served in larger epistemic frameworks and operated as an exp exploratory model for other domains. With these reflections, I would like so to conclude with the following remark on the title of Jungus' manuscript, Textual Contemplatio, that can be actually translated in two ways. First, contemplation of weaving, and third, second, contemplation of texture. Now, why texture? So I want to emphasize that explanations of weaving, as well as the notion of texture, can be seen as to coexist together in order to fill an explanation explanatory gap in atomist accounts or in other accounts of the sorts of properties that, on, that only occur in combinations in general or for explaining properties of particular materials. Now, this conception is certainly to be found in Jungius accounts, as we saw with this hypostatic and synipostatic parts, but not only in Jungius accounts. One can present though this is beyond the scope of this talk, a series of 17th century thinkers who employed the concept of texture in their works in order to shape atomism or corpuscularism. Thus, for example, Bacon, Gassendi, Charlton, Hooke, Boyle, Locke, all discussed the notion of texture, though obviously not for identical purposes. So Hooke example is the most well-known one. Hooke depicted and wrote down his reflections on observing silk, and taffeta with a magnifying glass in his 6065 uh, Micrographia. As he notes in the preface of Micrographia, the inquiry of weaving practices is essential to unfold how nature operates. So to conclude, as can be seen already in the writings of Jungius, but also of Hartlieb and Hooke and of other natural philosophers who are not discussed here, first-hand experiments of fabrics, as well as, as observations of them, of their production and of artisanal processes, did exist. Jungius attempted geometrization of weaving should be considered not as a simple implementation of a mathematical structure, but as a reorganization of weaving practices, one that also involves the presentation of a new structure of knowledge. This restructured knowledge is different from the knowledge the artisans and the practitioners possessed. This, together with the reflections on the structure of materials, points toward the tension between the various practices of mathematization of weaving in Jungus' thought on the one hand, and between mathematics and artisanal textile practices in the 17th century on the other hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Okay, so Tomas, sorry, we have. Um, assuming that we go a little over time, I think we have about nine minutes uh, for questions. So please raise your hands or um, oh, drop a line in the chat. Oop, there is some. Oh, uh, Bill, do you want to? Oh, you're making a point about William Petty, but. Yeah, that was more of an observation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sylvia? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> that was really interesting. I wanted to ask you something about the illustrations or diagrams. In fact, as you might imagine, I would ask something like that. Uh, but in fact, like I thought it was quite interesting to see the difference between uh, uh, the first kind of schematic uh, diagrams you were showing uh, 
the diagrams of the waving waves uh, and the difference compared to the drawing on, of the interwoven threads. Uh, and the first ones in particular, I thought they, they seemed to me pretty schematic. Uh, and in fact, it was pretty clear that they were non-metric in structure. And I was wondering whether you think like they also played a role in shaping the thinking uh, or the mathematics uh, of it or not, or yeah, whether you could say something about that. Yeah, that's a good question because what one question that obviously arises um, when inspecting Jung use well theorems is that um, what is missing is eventually these relations between the roles, um, and it's clear that the diagrams and these these exactly the diagrams is not just depictions of what is actually presented there uh, actually show the structure, uh, and for him these actually play um, well. Um, well, a diagrammatical reason, eventually, the, the role of diagrammatic reasoning. Um, however, he does say in some parts of this um, well, manuscript or collection of notes that a diagram can also deceive, actually, because what he imagined uh, in a diagram, he later actually inspects these um, weaves with a microscope or with a magnifying lens. It's not clear, actually, what kind of instruments he used there. And then he says, after inspecting this with uh, the microscope, actually saw that the diagram uh, doesn't show everything. So it's a kind of, let's call it a, a tricky position. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, this collection of notes was written in a period of almost 30 years. So it's also hard to say, well, in this year, you fought this and that, and in 20 years later, uh, you change your mind because the context also changes. Um, but it's clear that the, all of the, let's call it the geometric uh, set of notes was written in well, one specific period. Um, and all of the diagrams there actually play, let's call it the same role. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, just like super quick follow up, doesn't show everything. It's interesting. I don't know if exactly how he phrased it, but it might be uh, different compared is misleading because maybe a diagram, we don't want to show everything. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I, I, I think, well, to answer, I think what is actually being, uh, what he refers to is that the, the microscope actually accounts or uh, prompts another kind of visualization. Um, that actually is enabled by then by, by the instrument and not by the naked eye. And but this comes in another context that uh, is actually is optical investigations, which actually are formulated in a completely let's call it another language uh, concerning the style than the geometrical part of this manuscript. So it's clear that also the let's call it the culture that he embeds this set of notes is other is different. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Ken Archer. Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, do you feel like your study of uh, weaving, um, these works on weaving, supports Wong's arguments that the alliance of techne and praxis was the primary impetus for these trading zones? So do you like, do you see, is weaving being framed as a craft of public importance to princes and rulers uh, by Jungius? Okay, yeah, it's recorded, so I'll, uh, I'll answer. Um, okay, I won't be called politically correct. Uh, the, the answer is no, to be honest. Uh, I think what is being done, so it's clear that Jungius met the weaver, so he says that explicitly uh, that he observed um, Sartores, that is tailors or weavers by, uh, by their work. But um, first of all, um, it's not reciprocal. That is, you cannot say that uh, the encounter of Jungius of, with, with other um, thinkers that actually, that were presented here uh, was that the, the weavers actually benefited from them. Although I have to nuance my own answer, there are hardly any uh, textbooks of weaving 
uh, of weavers that really describe the action of weaving, uh, they hardly exist till the end of the 17th century. Um, so it's, um, but still, um, I think I said it explicitly, what Jungus actually presents for the weavers, it was uh, almost banal. Um, you can take a look at records. Um, I don't know. So what do you think? Oh, oh, what? Motivation. Sorry. Was? So what do you think his motivation was to formalize all of this artisanal? Knowledge? First of all, the entire discourse was on texture, which was highly uh, or very common in all of in, in many uh, 17th century natural philosophers, and that's clear. The that texture is, is not just a metaphor that uh, is being taken from uh, Lucretius, uh, the Rome Natua, uh, they really use, um, so they, they take weaving and weavers in, as an example, uh, but it always stays on a very, let's call it um, simple level. That is, you have the warp and the weft, that's it. Now, weaving was much more complex at that period. You had uh, damask and velvet, uh, if you know a little bit, it, it was wonderful creations, and none of them actually pops up in these um, in these writings of the 17th century uh, thinkers. Um, that uh, that is one one reason what actually uh, why Jung wrote about it. Um, I think the other reason um, was that uh, well, he, I think. He had some sort of fascination from weaving. That's clear, but I think that uh, Long's argument put, I think, too much emphasis on that. That there was a reciprocal uh, transfer of knowledge, uh, and I think you have to revise this argument that uh, not every encounter uh, was from not from every encounter the two sides benefited, and <laughs> at the same time the restructuration of knowledge. Uh, was resulted or resulted in in a knowledge that was uh, let's call it like that hardly resembled with one one started from that is with the real weaves. Um, so obviously one could say, yeah, weavers could have identified what is being written there, but what uh, were they going to do with it? Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, and with these two excellent questions, we actually filled up the uh, Q and A time. Um, so maybe we'll come back to this at the end if we have um, any any time left. Okay. Uh, now the last talk of the uh, evening, uh, Thomas Morel. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can. Um, it. <clears throat> and I will not talk about the, the minds and, and the quotes and um, try to um, go maybe in, in the direction that, that Michael uh, began, trying to look at possible um, encounters between artisans and uh, craftsmen and, and mathematicians in this time uh, early modern um, Saxony. So just to, to give a few short introduction, this uh, talk is a very, very limited case study that is part of a broader project uh, about underground mathematics, um, about so uh, geometry of silver mines in early modern Europe. This means that most of the actors of today's talk will be uh, mine surveyors, so people working and surveying silver mines of the Holy Roman Empire. And these people are uh, practitioners, and I would like to emphasize how important it is to look at um, exactly this kind of um, uh, uh, practitioners, instrument makers, reckoning uh, masters, and more generally of those people who maybe did not write or publish uh, anything, but took uh, an active uh, part in the transformation of uh, what mathematics meant in early modern uh, Europe or in the transformation of these uh, mathematical disciplines. And I think that is it's one reason why the concept of trading zones is useful because it underlines that, practi that practitioners matter and that uh, knowledge what was not only produced in, in universities or at courts, um, but I think also that the concept has led 
um, to some misunderstanding, um, some of which Michael has, has uh, begun to touch upon, uh, it, it's nice to emphasize uh, that arsenals, that mines, that uh, battlefields or workshops where um, uh, important places where encounters might, might happen. Um, but then one uh, has a first problem like almost immediately, which is that uh, sources about practitioners are often uh, non-existent. And when we have sources about practitioners, they are sometimes very difficult to use, um, which makes that many studies by default uh, still heavily focus on, on what scholars say. And then practitioners uh, almost uh, involuntarily uh, are still seen as someone like almost passive or static people, uh, or in the worst cases, as inspiring scholars instead of doing their own things. And I think it's not what Pamela Long has in, in mind, uh, as she, for instance, word that uh, trading zones where I quote, um, places where the skilled acquired some learning and the unskilled learned um, acquired some skills. So the two groups came closer together. Um, I'm not sure this was always the case, as the example of uh, Mihail has, has shown, but uh, I like the idea of um, groups coming closer together, and I hope that this will become clear in, in the talk. Um, uh, a second and, and main question I think that the, the, the concept of trading zones opens is uh, the question of trust in mathematics. Uh, so I, I agree that trading zones were places where one could exchange this mathematics mathematized knowledge about nature and this way of seeing the world, I think it's very important. Uh, a question that's important for me is uh, why? Why did mathematics came to be trusted in the first place? Why was the mathematization of nature seen as a promising way of doing things? Uh, why did the Elector of Saxony, why did the Holy Roman Emperor came to rely on mathematics for a wide range of things where they could have used uh, other? So um, my idea is that the statues of mathematics came in good part from successes um, of practitioners. The efficiency of this kind of very uh, low key um, practical mathematics paved the way for a culture of accuracy and mind surveyors are a very good example because we have actually a lot of sources about that. So in the first part, I will describe the concrete influence of mind surveyors and how they worked for political rules by focusing on one series of um, specific uh, episodes, disputes around the Saxon-Bohemian border in the 16th and 17th centuries, so very specific thing. And then in the second part, I will focus on one family of surveyors, the other family, the Saxons, who made their way from the, the mines, from a small mining, no, a big mining city, to uh, the court of Dresden. And I will try to show that their influence was much broader than what we expect. They were not just used for mining or even for engineering, but they came to be like an all purpose expert for everything related to arithmetics and, and um, geometry. And by doing so, it was not only for Saxony, but for much of the Holy Roman Empire. And by doing so, I argue that practitioners, in a way, uh, participated in transforming the scope and definition of what mathematics was and uh, what it could hope to achieve. So let's first have a look at, 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 at this map. Uh, so uh, an encounter at the Saxon-Bohemian border. We're so in the 16th and early 17th century and this uh, region, the all mountains of Saxony, so the Erzgebirge, were among the richest and the most densely populated regions in Europe. Uh, in the north, we have the electorate of Saxony. So one of the most powerful uh, Player in the Holy Roman Empire, and in the south we have the Kingdom of um, of Bohemia, and the wealth of this region came from the mining boom, uh, when veins of silver were discovered in many places and powered a, a large part of the European economy. So the border was highly disputed, given that some uh, veins stretched on both territories. So it was not just a matter of um, of geopolitics; it was also very important to know exactly where the border would be would be set. So you, 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 can, you can guess that the, the, the ascertaining the exact frontier between Saxony and Bohemia was very um, hard diplomatic uh, issue. Both sides uh, agreed to send a first mission in 1550. Uh, and then the issue resurfaced several times 
uh, and until the end of the century. And this map is actually from 1604, when both sides again decided to send, I quote, mathematicians uh, and settle the issue by drawing this, uh, this map. Uh, so first, um, a set of question would be for me, uh, what does it mean to use mathematics to solve um, a borders dispute? Okay, we know that you can survey with geometry, but concretely, what does this mean? How exactly were the measurements made? What were the instruments? You, you can already um, you can already see kind of uh, here. You, you you can see like this <clears throat> the instrument that we used uh, as an image for the seminar today. Um, what were the instruments? What were the methods? Um, and then how was the mathematical result turned into a political decision? It's, it's not enough to do some mathematics, then you have to do something with it in, in the real world. How could someone build a consensus and enforce trust in, in geometry? Who were the person who realized this operation? Um, it's not only about measuring, but one should also produce the map, codify the mathematics into a legal document, um, and finally, enforce the decision that is, one has to materialize the measurement by a real world border between Saxony and Bohemia. So, who were the, um, the actors? On the side of Saxony, we have so mine surveyors, superior surveyors, as I told. Uh, they were normally responsible for setting the concession limit in the mines, but they could also be employed for other things. Um, they were also accompanied by, by scholars such as Johannes Rumelius, who was professor of mathematics at the University of Leipzig or Saxony. And on the side of Bohemia, the 1550 expedition, so not the one on this map, the previous one, uh, featured uh, a, a quite famous artist, Augustin Hirschvogel, who was um, an artist, uh, itch makers, and uh, court mathematics, also known for his map making. So geometry was seen as a way to get a grasp on the problem. It's a very um, mountainous area. You have woods. Obviously, you cannot just send the rules and, and, and take a decision like that. Um, but the first mission was not uh, meant to be about uh, pure geometry. Uh, at first, the two rulers just asked a group of people to go there for what they called an Augenschein. Uh, the Augenschein, what we could translate it by visual inspection, it's a standard procedure that's rooted in ancient Roman law. It means having a look at all the issue, maybe perform measurement uh, on site, and then um, make a political or juridical negotiation. Um, but the mathematical practitioners quickly were able to convince the rulers that measurements had um, to be made in order to get an overview of, of, the, of the problem. So it's also shown these episodes. I mean, this kind of map making uh, really began in the 16th or early 17th century. It also shows that the role of mathematics at the time was um, was was changing. Uh, so I have to, yeah. Um, let's focus on this survey, the one who, who led to the cult. It was carried out on the Saxon side by Matthias Uder and Melchior Jöstel. So Jöstel was a famous professor of mathematics um, in, in Saxony who had experience in maps, so it's quite logical to see him there. And Matthias Oeder was a subterranean surveyor, someone who normally worked in the mines, but then went uh, surface, so to say, to perform measurements. Um, in the letter written directly to Oeder, that's also interesting, uh, the Elector of Saxony directly writes to these two persons. Um, and so Christian II of Saxony spoke of existing errors, Irungen, and asked, to uh, survey comprehensively the context of border territories, fix Stücke, and bring them um, on a plan. It's not entirely clear to me what the errors were meant to be. It's probably the conflict with Bohemia that led him to open again this, this, uh, this, this thing. So what, what I find really interesting is the idea that the survey had to be performed by bringing together a mine surveyor, so practitioner, and a university professor. The things uh, quickly get more interesting for me uh, because the elector also asked that the two mathematicians bring, hire and bring on site a notary and a painter to draw the map, along with the journeyman, obviously. The notary uh, was meant to confer higher a juridical authority to the measurement, while the painter had to embody it 
um, into a physical object, a map. So producing real life mathematics involves a lot of different skills and layers of meaning that go beyond the abstract geometrical reasoning uh, into a map, a legal setting, and so on. So in, in this way, I found the concept of trading zones also useful because all these per persons had a different culture and a different uh, view of what uh, a map or what geometry should be. And they had to collaborate um, to fulfill the, the electors uh, order. Uh, then numerous workers, journeymen, had to be hired to materialize the border once it had been set. Uh, um, border stones, so these are high, high um, were set. You, you can see them, um, I think here, no, here is, a, here, is a, here is a tree, but sometimes you can see there on, on some points of the maps, they were disposed at regular interval, but it's not sufficient if you want to materialize the border in, in the mountains. Um, it, the forest is so dense that they knew that the, the stones would not be visible after a couple of decades. So they had um, to, to dig ditches, such as what you can see here or here. Uh, trunks were felled on large portions, really materialized hit. The trees were planted anew in straight lines, so you have really this um, geometry made visible. Um, and some remarkable trees, you can see them here, were painted um, and engraved, carved in specific symbols, such as the one the surveyors used to have in mind. Uh, and all these material operations were then represented on the map itself. So you have these two layers of geometry on site and on site. So this means that in the early modern period, a large amount of skills were necessary to process, represent, and embody the data collected by surveyors in order to make mathematics visible. Um, the example, I, I think, can be taken um, further. Um, after a first series of measurements made uh, by Matthias Hoder, so the mine surveyor, and the University of Sao Justel, Justel uh, then decided to stay on site um, and uh, to perform new measurements on its own. In a letter to Hoder, uh, he explained his decision and wrote, my good friend, I shall not conceal to you that I have decided to survey the composite water new. It's my method. And from that, we can grasp that this instrument that's used here is um, an instrument that was used by Gestel and not by uh, other mind surveyors used different kind of instruments. So he was professor of mathematics at the University of Wittenberg, the leading place for astronomy, obviously. And he went on to explain that he used an astronomical device, measuring device. And it's pretty rare to have uh, an actual mention of a learned instrument used in actual surveying works. And Yostel had to mention that in his letter to, to the mine surveyor because the task would, I quote, take its proper time. So he was saying to him, okay, do not let the painter draw the map now because I have new measurements to, to, to make. What was the instrument? It's interesting that the painter, Hans Richter, uh, ultimately decided to draw the instrument uh, with the same description that was used in, in the letter, an astronomical Maßstab, so astronomical measuring uh, instrument, uh, and it combines a semicircle and, and a compass on the resulting map. It's kind of a, a, a proto-theodolite, one might say. And if we look at it, this instrument closely matches a piece belonging to the Elector's art chamber, the Kunstkammer. And this instrument, we can, I, I'm pretty sure of it, had been made by Christoph Kekler. And Christoph Tetzler, one of these instrument maker that was making instruments um, uncommon for, for the various uh, electors and, and princes of Saxony. It would be too long to make the full history of this uh, instrument, but the instrument itself was the product of a collaboration between uh, at least two persons, the instrument maker, Tetzler, and um, someone called Abraham Ries, who's very famous as the son uh, of Adam Ries, and both of these uh, people, the Ries uh, family, several of them, all came from the same mining city as the um, other. So the methods and instruments employed for the survey of the Bohemian border um, exemplifies how the Saxon elector brought together a large uh, amount of people, scholars and practitioners, such as Matthias Oder, and how the use of mathematics in real life 
was uh, not only an individual abstract work, but large scale enterprise in which many people collaborated. And this is why I think it's useful to uh, rely on the concept of trading zones to understand this kind of thing. So let's now focus a bit more closely on, um, on the other family. Um, the other family is um, first mentioned in Annaberg. And Annaberg, when one of these blooming mining cities, it's founded in the 90s, and it quickly becomes a very, very big city. Uh, we, we tend to think of the mines or all the trading zones as remote places where scholars really have to go to find a new knowledge. Actually, they were big. I quote here from a Münster's Topographia. I could almost take them, so the mining cities, for one of our great cities, Erfurt, Prague, or among Italiantos, Bologna and Padua. So as I said, this region was highly um, populated. Annaberg, uh, at, at its height, has a school that was bigger than many German universities. It had a library, it had an herb garden, even had a painter for some times. Um, so these uh, trading zones were very much not places only for uh, practitioners, but for large gatherings too. The first order is mentioned shortly after uh, the city was founded. It's Georg, Georg Oder the first, who was a um, mining official. He buys a house in the city. That's how we find it with trace. He was specialized in measurement and survey, obviously. He could drain tunnels in the mine and was also had a legal role. And he was soon appointed among the aldermen of the city. So at the time, being a mathematical practitioner was a pretty big, a pretty big deal. His son, um, who no, who did not die the same year, obviously, and that, that's a, a typo, who was born around 1511, uh, um, wrote in a letter, my late father and I were always performing uh, underground geometry, setting the marking stones and bringing the vertical in, into the mine. And his reputation was such that um, he was frequently called to other regions of the empire, such as the city of Goslar in the Hearts or Goldkrona in Franconia to perform measurements. And that's another thing we, we, we usually um, do not have in mind when we talk about uh, practitioners or trading zones. It's that it's not only scholars who have this kind of network that can go all over uh, say Europe, but um, there were also communication and exchanges between uh, the mathematical practitioners themselves. Um, then when the first dispute in 1550 at the Bohemian border exploded, uh, who uh, did the electoral call? It was this Georg the II. And then the success of the operation led him to be appointed court mine surveyor, which is a bit contradictory because obviously there were no mines in, in Dresden, uh, but it was more like a honorific title. And it was among um, the category of goldsmith, crewmakers, clockmakers, painters, wood turners, and locksmiths. Once again, we see potential for collaboration. He lived in Dresden until his son, Georg Oder III, succeeded him. And after him, Matthias Oder, the one I just mentioned, went, all of them went to work for the uh, Elector of Saxony. The Elector of Saxony at the time was uh, August, who was fond of mathematics, who attracted a lot of people and asked them to, to collaborate. And what I find interesting is that um, when uh, the other family was in Dresden and worked as court surveyor, they were very versatile engineers and they were not only working in the context of mining, they could, um, be asked to produce anything. I, I don't really have the time to go into details, but they were asked to dig very specific wells in, in the, the Saxon fortification. They could serve as military engineers. Um, they were involved in canal diggings, in trenches, and obviously in map making, not only at the border, but they were also involved in the huge uh, map making project of the whole of Saxony. So cool places where Places of um, encounters and collaboration where various kinds of artists and engineers learn to know each other's crafts. Uh, instruments maker worked with underground surveyors who in turn operated with university professors. So circulation of knowledge between principles have been studied um, most prominently by, by Bruce Moran, who described them as institutional modes of activities. And I think it could be useful to to better understand both the practical mathematics and the dynamics of this court's life, consider them 
together with the mines, Tallinn and the rest of the provinces are standing in, in the broader sense. Um, um, mathematical practitioners were asked to collaborate, uh, but what also I find very interesting is that the frontier between the categories of scholars and practitioners sometimes blurs. And that's, I think, uh, what um, Pamela Long means when she said that these categories came closer together as they uh, and began to understand each other. Uh, for example, these images here, uh, it's taken from um, a small booklet called um, the Geometria. And it was actually um, a short treatise on, on practical geometry that was made by an instrument maker, Christoph Schistler. He designed a quadratum geometricum for the um, for the elector, and at the same time, he also sent a booklet explaining the mathematics that were behind. So it's not just scholars on the one side writing treatises and instrument makers building instruments. Then, but the categories could fluctuate, and I think that the Erdo family is a good example of these mine surveyors that at first have very specific skills, and then uh, gradually uh, can apply them in a wide setting because. Why? Just because practical mathematics, when you're good at it, you can apply it in, in many different contexts. So the mine surveyors played an active role in monitoring and improving the electoral dominion, and then digging, mining. Um, and so the value of practical mathematics um, uh, gained a public recognition at the court of Dresden and in many other courts of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it's what Michael Corey's uh, of Dresden had called the geometry of power. Um, and then it's a bit uh, a chicken and the egg question, was this the cause or the consequence of the existence of trading zones? It's a bit of both. It's, I mean, when the first contacts proved to be, in some cases, very uh, successful, then it, it brought uh, further reasons for these people to collaborate. And um, I would argue that this culture of mechanics around the extraction of metallic ore found a broad um, resonance within the Holy Roman Empire and uh, that this was crucial, in a way, to the evolution of mathematical disciplines in the early modern period. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, and uh, thank you for finishing uh, in time. So, uh, yeah, we have some time for uh, questions. Please raise your hands or drop a hand um, note in the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Uh, thanks for the talk. So I have actually a question, uh, well, actually a general one um, about this geometry of power. So it's clear that there are power relations in the whole mining industry. Um, I guess also because it was um, an endless source of money. Uh, the question is, can you locate other, um, I don't know, cultural domains or occupations in early modern period that functioned in a similar way? Uh, well, obviously Long uh, has the, its uh, free examples uh, in her book, uh, which I forgot, uh, but I don't know, can you, uh, because I ask because weaving is obviously in some sense is, an, is a non-example. Um, yeah. Although there it's also uh, have a lot of funding that flows. Um, yeah, I um, yeah, I, I think I, I mean, one obvious example would be uh, masters and merchant arithmetic, with like the Riz family, who um, who then uh, uh, works in all kind of, of domains related to, to, to that. Uh, but like like hearing your talk, I I I, I really ask myself almost the same question, how comes that in some domains such as mining it's so successful and you really see collaboration and in other such as weaving, uh, it doesn't work. I mean, first of all, I, it, I think it's also due to the fact that we are getting closer to the history of technology and then you have just what's technically possible or relevant and what is not. Um, and, and then maybe one distinction, would, one way to, to look at it would be to use um, Edgar Tilsel's definition of a superior craftsman, uh, because in his, he's arguing in a similar direction as, as Pamela Long uh, about the rise of new sciences, the role of the exchanges between practitioners and, 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 and scholars. And he's making this distinction, not saying that all practitioners were involved, but only the superior ones. And among the superior ones are the architects. Uh, they, I would put my Mark Scheider mind surveillance into it, but 
not all domains involve people with enough mathematical literacy to make them make that efficient. Uh, that's another example given by Rick Paul about this timber mathematics, and I haven't found anything relevant in it. One reason might be because timber, just as weaving, was, was not at the point where it could be mathematized. Thanks. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, Monica? Okay. Thank you so much. I, I got a sense of the landscape and bird's eye view. But the moment I saw that instrument <laughs> and I thought about the line, the mines, I started to think, I don't know anything about how mathematics is used in mining. <laughs> uh, so it seems like one problem, I mean, it sounds obvious, like, yes, you build a, well, might dig in some, you know, shafts and you end up in finding a mine, but there seem like so many actual problems, right? So how do you know that the shaft is vertical and how do you know how far down it goes right yeah. so i have you looked at the actual practical mathematics out of it i mean i could i tried to figure out like in that drawing of the instrument to see how they could possibly figure it out i mean like what exactly <laughs> i mean what exactly would an instrument do if you're down in you know in a mine and like what would the measurement look like in there right except, except for the lever with a bubble i can't think of anything that would make sense to me to use right but that was not the instrument right it was something with angles and stuff so i yeah i just i'm curious if you've actually tried to see what they were trying to do even like like a simple example yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I just wrote a whole book about it, so I have plenty to say on, on, on the topic. So this very instrument um, was not used in the mines because it came from the art chamber of the elector. So it was more, uh, it, it was, I think, closer maybe to some astronomical instruments, but um, people working in the mines were working with much more simple things. Uh, and like the, the, the first obvious instrument would be to use uh, this concentric circle uh, with, uh, with a compass uh, at the middle, uh, and they were basically trying to show how the um, shaft in which their direction they were going. So they were basically at first recording, let's say, horizontal angles, and then measuring with, um, with mesh nodes or with measuring chains in order to, to, to look at it. It's, it's very complicated because when you're underground, you cannot use triangulation. You can use any kind of uh, triangle geometry, which makes everything more difficult. And um, and the, the worst thing with mind surveying is that if you're wrong, you will probably never know it and just dig for years and spend thousands of dollars and just ruin your own enterprise. So it's um, it, it's really a big deal. But um, uh, and it's also the reason why scholars writing on the topic until well into the 18th century. Uh, really had difficulty to grasp what practitioners were doing, and practitioners on their side were only working with manuscripts, uh, homemade instruments, and really are kind of, kind of almost a bubble. It's, it's a bit caricatural to say that, but it's almost like that, yeah. Thank you. Right, so uh, we are out of time, but if there are more questions, I will like let it go on for a few minutes. So anyone uh, last chance to um, ask anything of Tama or um, the other panelist? Jen okay, can I ask a quick question? On... Oh, uh, someone was talking, but I didn't see who it was. Sorry, it was uh, Dan had a question earlier on. Uh, Dan, would you like to ask your question now? Yeah. This goes back to um, Angela's talk. Thank you, by the way, all three of you for very, very interesting talks. One brief comment on uh, Thomas's, that when you are talking about mathematics, of course, you are talking about mixed mathematics rather than, rather than pure mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. My question to you would be um, how the kinds of mixed mathematics, I mean, Obviously, it's going to be connected with pure mathematics, like particularly geometry and so on, but how the kind of mixed mathematics, 
that was being used in mines related to other domains of mixed mathematics um, at the time. Um, and um, to a certain extent, this is also connected with the um, question that I had originally wanted to ask um, Angela, which is uh, you're looking at specifically geometry in the 16th century. Now, when I teach about um, um, sort of academic natural philosophy in the um, 17th century, one of the things I did look at was the kinds of mathematics textbooks uh, that they were using. And this is admittedly somewhat um, later. And um, so for example, um, I looked at um, uh, Kekerman, who does give a certain amount of um, 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 geometry, but also includes in his textbook on mathematics, um, um, things like um, geography, uh, nautical problems, um, things of that sort. Um, but I was most struck by uh, Galtrush, who was a popular textbook writer in the 17th century, who has a, um, a textbook that I think was widely used called, um, you know, um, the whole of mathematics, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, chronology, uh, nomonica, which would be the theory of sundials, uh, geography, optics, and music. Um, the stuff that you were looking at looked like, Angela, it was more, more specifically um, geometrical. Were there these other kinds of textbooks as well in the 16th century? Or was that a later development? And how is it that the more strictly geometrical um, stuff, whether it's sort of more Euclidean or more applied, would fit in with this sort of larger conception of mathematics that I think one would have found, at least in, you know, if you're looking at Galtrush and in, in, in some of the Jesuit institutions. Um, well, the kind of textbooks that you describe, I, I, I haven't encountered as such, obviously, because it's a different period and different context. And, but you do have kind of this encounter between these different disciplines, um, practical mathematics, applied mathematics, mixed mathematics, natural philosophy, in encyclopedia, such as the the Valas uh, de Expetendis et Fugendis Rebus Opus, or um, the Margarita Philosophica by, by uh, Gregor Reich. Yeah. So that's obviously uh, the first candidates. But you can also think of uh, uh, Charles de Beauvel's uh, um, Geometry Pratique, so obviously uh, uh, named Practical Geometry, in which he also presents very heterogeneous um, contents on um, the, 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 sorry, the direction of water, uh, how to, um, the, 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 the geometry of water mills. Um, it's, it's not only um, applied geometry uh, as in surveying, which you would find in a traditional practical geometry, but there's a lot of philosophy, natural philosophy, engineering, inventions and the, 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 the structure of fire and, and the different elements. So a bit platonic there, it's, it's a mismatch. And so it's, it's a wonderful book, which obviously I don't know, it wasn't how, to, to which extent it was taught. I mean, he was teaching uh, in, in Paris um, at the end of the 15th century, beginning of 16th century, but this is quite later. And I don't, I don't think that was kind of, work that was actually taught uh, directly to students, but it was more of a, of a pleasant a way to uh, learn about geometry. And there was obviously a lot of Euclid there, but very simplified, very um, made, made very concrete and hands-on. That's a, a book that I've studied, but I, I couldn't present it here because it was such, so different from the others that I presented. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe just very briefly um, about this um, mixed mathematics. 
Um, I mean, the, the, the concept of mixed mathematics or mathematic mixed, uh, it's, it's very often used by, um, by scholars themselves, such as the, the, the Republic of Letter. Um, I, I, I tend to, to prefer the term of practical mathematics because um, I think that um, there were the, some scholars uh, had this idea in mind that mathematics was a general language that could be applied in many different settings. Um, and practitioners could do very different things, not exactly in the same way. I mean, a very good example is the, the theory of water wheels, for instance, where you have generations of scholars producing theories about how one should make, make the best water wheels, and, and none of them really works. Uh, and it's, it's the practitioners who do that in a very piecemeal fashion. So the, the connection between, for instance, these main surveyors and, and some domains, um, are obvious, like in map making or in general surveying, it, it's clear. Um, with a military uh, architecture, it's also very clear that it's really in a piecemeal fashion. I mean, this idea that you can really use uh, mathematics for everything, um, it's, it's not exactly something that you find by scholar, even when they do a lot of different things, because they know they can't go too far. Because if, if a scholar uh, makes a, a book about water wheels and it doesn't work, it's not his problem. But if a petitioner is mandated by the elector to build something and it doesn't work, then he falls out of favor. And I had no time to explain that the third Georg of the family actually gets kicked out of court for one of these uh, instances. So he was not able to fulfill his duty. So he was kicked out, and his brother had to take the place. And look, <laughs> he was lucky enough to, to make it. But I mean, you really do not have exactly the same level of, of pressure from the side of practitioners. Yeah, if I can add to this, uh, I agree that practical mathematics and mixed mathematics were different in the sense that mixed mathematics referred rather to uh, optics or astronomy. I mean, of course, you, you do have overlaps, such as when you look at uh, classifications, ancient classifications of science, uh, where you have uh, uh, logistics and and, and, and surveying next to astronomy and mechanics. But however, for, for me, for the authors that I've looked at, it's more uh, physical mathematical science would be called mixed mathematics or well, practical mathematics, actual mathematics, but it's used to solve concrete problems in a way. And also I would distinguish also applied mathematics, which is just that, and practical mathematics, which is a little bit more general, which is more what I was presenting, although, these all these categories overlap, and that's why it's so interesting to actually uh, look into uh, the definition of what is practical mathematics for each of well, these authors. I, I do think that they really do overlap. I mean, where would you put um, the theory, the theory of um, military fortifications? Yeah. For example, which was considered one of the branches of mixed mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that changes over time also in yeah. the 17th century is very different from what we find in the 16th century. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, my apologies for uh, going over the, the time limit. So let's give our speakers a round of applause. I will start, and I'm probably the only one you can hear. Um, right. Uh, and next week, Spinoza is back. So join us for a panel on Spinoza's complete uh, compendium of um, Hebrew grammar. Okay. See you all next week. Thank you. Bye.